Hi, everyone. We are going to go ahead and dive right in. Um, I am so excited that you guys are here for week two of Spiritual Friendship, and hopefully you guys are recovered from last week and we didn't go too, uh, too deep, um, but prepare yourself because we're also going to be going into a lot of content today too, so be ready to take a lot of notes and we'll dive right in and it's going to be so much fun. So we're going to go ahead and start with a little icebreaker. So just like how we did last time, I want you to kind of get into groups around you, introduce yourself if you haven't met those people before, and I want you to begin by answering this question. If you could be friends with anyone in the whole world, who would it be and why? If you could be friends with anyone in the whole world, who would it be and why? Go ahead and take a couple of minutes, and we'll come back, and I'd love to hear your answers, too. All right, is there anyone who has an answer that they would just absolutely love to share with the whole group? Krista. <laughs> Sorry, you were called out. I was looking for volunteers. Carrie <laughs> Walsh. Why Carrie Walsh? Um, well, she's done amazing things like on the Olympic front as well and stayed mm. very humble throughout all of her successes, which is really neat. Mm. Very nice. Yeah, that's, that's a real challenge. Well, I mean, I don't know why. <laughs> we'll cross that bridge when we get there, huh? <laughs> Someone from this side. If you could be friends with anyone in the whole world, who would it be and why? Benjamin Netanyahu. Who's that? <laughs> that's a crazy one. Oh, okay. No, oh, yeah. I should have. I mean, he he kind of knows that Israel's practicing Jewish mm. worship. Yeah, it's awesome huge. Who else? Who would yours be? Who would mine be? So I would pick two. Uh, Steve Jobs, just because I think he is a complete visionary, changed the world multiple times with his just creative and genius. Uh, would love to get inside of his head. I've heard he's not the most pleasant person to be around. That's the only problem. Uh, and then I would also pick Chris Pratt, because I truly believe he's my spirit animal. I feel like our souls are connected. No, I'm just kidding. People say, like, dude, you're just like Emmett from the Lego movie. Like, I, don't, I don't see the connection. <laughs> so, so maybe, maybe you do see it. So maybe all of us have this person in mind, or if you don't, my favorite was Justin's answer. Uh, anyone who would babysit my kids, I think, is, I think that's classic. <laughs> Krista would. Look, you guys can be friends. So now... Our second question, and this is also the first blank of your packet, why do you feel like you can't be friends with this person? For some of you, it's because they're dead. That's, that's an obvious answer. But if you were living with the same, like in the same time period or at the same time when they were still alive, why would you feel like you can't be friends with that person? Take a couple minutes, dialogue with each other, or just write some general notes down. Then I'd love to hear some of your thoughts. All right, so does anyone have some reasons why you feel like you can't be friends with this person that you like to share? They're fictional. They're fictional. Yeah, so they don't even exist. <laughs> that's a pretty important part of friendship, being a physical reality. Yeah, that's great. Who is the person that you selected that you chose? <laughs> that's awesome. <laughs> it's a great evolutionary version of Pikachu. I love it. Uh, Oh, Reepichu. I was thinking of uh, Raichu for some reason. Goodness, that's embarrassing. Whole other level. <laughs> what other reasons do we feel like we can't be friends with these people? Distance. Yeah, expound on that a little bit, Deborah. Well, I mean, if you're living in a separate different state, you can't talk to them. Mm. Like they establish a relationship with you, you can't talk to them. Um, and also the person that Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's a huge thing. Who's who's the person? Mm. Yeah, they're they're watch they're security guards who are watching those people like a hawk. Makes it really difficult. <laughs> they won't respond. Yeah. They won't uh mm. they won't maintain that end of the conversation, the communication. It's huge. Mm. 
Yeah, yeah, for sure. Uh, all those huge things. And I think the, the fun part with this question is we love to think about people that we know we can't be friends with. If we were given the opportunity to be friends with these people, we would jump on it. But the reason why we can't, why we're not friends with them is because of a lot of times it's the elevated status. A lot of times it's where they're located uh, physically and we just can't get there or they're just on a whole other realm of life that we can just never work our way up towards. So finally, with that in mind, how would you answer this third question? How does this relate to being friends with God? Or how may this relate to being friends with God? Just take some moments for you to reflect on that yourself and take a couple of notes in your packet. Just keep that on your mind as we move forward this evening. Be keeping that on the back of your mind as we're moving forward because we do have a a lot of content that we're going to cover today. So I'm hoping that we'll be done by 7.30. We may go just a bit over, so hang in there with me, and it's going to be a blast. But just for us to recap from last week, we talked about how we are all wired for connection, right? We're talk, we talked about how we are designed to exist in community and how it's not good for man to be alone. Yet in America, we are considered to be some of the loneliest people in the entire world, which goes against the very design of what it means to be persons, where we're, de- where we're defined by who we're with, right? So we're all designed for community. We're all designed for connection. And so this idea of spiritual friendship, which we're going to unpack over these next couple of weeks, are going to set us up for how we can remedy the loneliness pandemic that pervades our entire culture. So today, we're going to talk about the greatest friendship we could ever possibly have. We're going to talk about what it means to befriend the Lord. We're going to talk about what it means to befriend Jesus Christ as our Savior. And before we go any further, I want to give a shout out to this book called God is Friendship by Brian Edgar. If you are interested in this topic even further, I give so much of the content for this class that we developed, and especially for this session, to this. So please feel free to write that down if you're wanting to go into it. It's an amazing book that'll totally blow your mind in this whole realm. So without further ado... Whenever I think about being friends with Jesus, this immediately comes to my mind. Go ahead and roll it, Taryn. Jesus is a friend of mine. Jesus is my friend. Jesus is a friend of mine. I have a friend in Jesus. Jesus is a friend of mine. Jesus is my friend. Jesus is a friend of mine. He taught me how to live my life as it should be. He taught me how to turn my cheek when people laugh at me. I've had friends before, and I can tell you that he's one who will never leave you flat. Jesus is a friend of mine. Jesus is my friend. Jesus is a friend of mine. I have a friend in Jesus. Jesus is a friend of mine. Jesus is my friend. Jesus is a friend of mine. Okay, Darren, you can, you can shut that off, please. <laughs> Isn't that like the best thing you've ever seen? That comes straight from the heart of YouTube. It has like 10 million views. It's fantastic. If you want to watch it in its entirety, just search Jesus is my friend, and it's like the first thing that comes up. It's literally like a whole other level of hokiness that you could ever possibly see. But I think what's so funny about that video isn't just how cheesy it is. I think we also laugh at the very idea of being friends with Jesus. Like, when we actually pause long enough to consider, like, what what does it mean to be friends with God? I think we kind of like, that's kind of funny. Like, do we ever actually legitimately think about the potential of being buddy-buddy with the God of the universe? You know, and I think all of us may respond to that first, of like, yeah, yeah, I... I'm Jesus' friend. We're pals. We're best buds. Hopefully none of you in here say, Jesus is my boyfriend. Please. Some people say that and they believe it and it's like the weirdest thing ever, so don't be that. Um, (laughs) But if we're honest, more often than not, I think viewing Jesus as our friend is more of a nice-sounding ideal than a legitimate description for how we relate with our Savior. Correct me if I'm wrong with this assumption, but I think um, the majority of us may be uncomfortable 
with truly, actually, legitimately being friends with the Almighty God. And we have some pretty good reason to be uncomfortable with this. And so, thankfully, Jesus' disciples experienced a very, a very similar level of discomfort with being friends with Christ. And it puts all of this in perspective for us. So, over the next couple of weeks, we're really going to be highlighting John chapters 13 through 17. We're going to look at some bits and pieces here and there. But it's these five chapters of Scripture that are the Apostle John's account for the upper room or the night that Jesus was betrayed. He has like a whole other conversation with or between Jesus and his disciples that are probably the most important words Jesus ever says to his disciples. Uh, these chapters include everything from what it means for the Holy Spirit to enter into their life and Jesus' plans to leave the world and the disciples' role in furthering the mission he started, all ending with a huge prayer for his current disciples, but also for the future of the church. But one of the big overarching themes in these chapters is God revealing an entire new way for what it means to relate with him. And so we're going to begin with this uh, in John chapter 13, verse 3. This is how Jesus kicks this entire dialogue off. And it says that Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power, that he had come from God and was returning to God. So in other words, Jesus had complete power. He had complete sovereignty. He was infinite. He could do anything he possibly wanted, okay? Because Jesus is God. But check this out. So, that's the biggest so that you will probably ever read in literature. So, Jesus knew the Father. He has all these things under his power. He could do literally anything. So, he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, and wrapped a towel around his waist, and began washing his disciples' feet. That is literally like the most paradoxical thing that you could have ever imagined Jesus doing. Like, that is something that's reserved for slaves and for servants. He had all the power in the world, and he chooses to sacrifice himself, to lay himself down and to serve the disciples by washing their feet. And I love Peter's response in verse 8. I'm going to give you the Jake Thurston translation of it. Uh, heck no, Jesus. You're not going to wash my feet. You do, not, you do not do that. This is something I should be doing for you. He was probably imagining, I do not relate with my God like this. I'm supposed to be serving you. And it's really crucial that we understand Peter's response here and just Christ serving his disciples in this way because this sets us up for everything that we're going to be talking about for the rest of this session. And so the main passage we're going to be looking at over these next three weeks as we unpack what spiritual friendship is is found in John chapter 15, beginning in verses 9 and going through 17. It's going to be on the screens here, but it's also in your packet. And let's see what Jesus reveals to us. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you, Jesus says. Now remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends. For everything that I have learned from my father, I have made known to you. And you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. So whatever you ask in my name, the father will give you. This is my command. Love each other. Okay, so there is so much to unpack here. That's why we're taking the next three weeks to talk about this passage. And right off the bat, Jesus reveals some really important things about friendship, both with how we relate to each other as a church, which is what we're going to be talking about next week, but he primarily introduces this idea of relating with him as a friend, as friends. 
And the first thing that we need to understand about spiritual friendship is that it's bound by love. Like, no duh, right? Like, I think we all know and figured spiritual friendship, let alone just friendship as a whole, is going to be bound by love. But what Jesus reveals to us is that this isn't just any kind of love that we're talking about here. This is a a love that comes straight from the divine. This comes straight from God himself. And it's a love that is countercultural to what we're used to. Because spiritual friendship is bound by self-sacrificial love. That, that's your blank. It's, uh, it's the kind of love that the Father has for Jesus. It's the kind of love that Jesus has for us. And it's the kind of love that we're somehow to reciprocate and give back to Jesus, let alone to each other. And it's to lay down one's life. It's to sacrifice. It's to serve. But the thing that confuses me the most about this passage that makes absolutely no sense is when Jesus talks in verse 15. And he says that, I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends. For everything that I have learned from my father, I have made known to you. I no longer call you servants. Instead, I have called you friends. So this is where things get to a little uncomfortable because for the past three years, the disciples have been traveling with Jesus, ministering with Jesus, and the big message that Jesus keeps preaching to his disciples is that you have to serve. You have to lay down your life and pick up your cross and follow me. He, he teaches them that the last will be first and that the least will be the greatest and that the Son of Man did not come to be served but to serve. Like service and servanthood is the key part of the Christian faith to them. It's the key part of their life and it's been drilled into their heads ever since they went on this journey with Jesus. And this whole perspective of life, this whole idea of that the last will be first and that the, the least will be the greatest— is what we know as the great reversal. Maybe you've heard that phrase before, and it's just that idea um, that we are constantly, constantly, constantly striving to be the last people. It's this humility. It's a service-oriented type of life. And for us to live according to the great reversal, we understand ourselves as servants of Christ, right? We understand ourselves as servants. But what's so puzzling about this passage is that Jesus doesn't call his disciples servants anymore. He calls them friends. He calls them friends. And so Brian Edgar describes this whole dialogue as the great reversal of the great reversal. (laughs) The disciples have finally gotten this whole service-oriented lifestyle drilled into their minds, and they have been making sure that they are sacrificing themselves and to be servants to Christ, who was previously their teacher and their rabbi and most recently discovered their God for crying out loud. But now Jesus says, you're not my servants. You're my friends. Think of like the highest CEO in your organization who doesn't view you as simply an employee, but actually gets down on your level and say, we're friends. Like that was a switch that the disciples had the hardest time flipping. And I think it's a switch that may still be difficult for us to flip as well. Because if you think about it, throughout the entire history of the church, we've been infatuated with this idea of service, right? Like, just as the disciples had to live by this great reversal mentality, this idea of serving instead of being served and making sure that you're the last, like, it's, it's constantly drilled into us, which is, which is really, really important But something we have to consider here, something that we have to remember, is that how we relate with God determines how we serve him. Or to put it the other way, how we serve God is determined by how we relate with him. And this is something that I really want us to dialogue quite a bit here and for us to camp out here for a bit. So we talk a lot about having a relationship with God right? Like, you'll probably go on maybe some of your friends' Facebook profiles, and you see, like, their religious preferences, and you'll see under, yeah, the religious preferences, it's not a religion, 
It's a relationship, <laughs> right? And we constantly use this language of being in a relationship with God, but have you ever thought, like, what kind of a relationship are we talking about here? Do we even know? I just think it's really funny because we kind of just say, yeah, I have a relationship with God, I have a relationship with Jesus, but we really don't specify what that relationship is. We kind of keep it this broad, ambiguous thing. But yet, if we look at all of our other relationships that we have in our life, we have certain titles or roles that we give those people which help us to know exactly how we relate with them. So, for example, I don't just say, I have a relationship with Heidi Thurston. I say, Heidi is my mom. And that title, mother, determines how I interact with her, the actions that I take with her and the actions that she takes with me. Or even, I don't just genuinely say, I have a relationship with Phil Wiseman. I say, Phil Wiseman is my boss. And so the interactions I have there are based on a lot of the titles that we associate with them. And so it's the same thing with our friends. It's the same thing with our coworkers and our teachers and uh, our bosses. Pretty much anyone that you can think of, we give these titles to help us know how to relate with that particular person. Because how we relate with our bosses are very different from how we relate with our mothers, right? So it's good that we have these, these things. So what's important for us to know, especially in our relationship with God, are the titles that we give him and how they actually determine how we relate with him. So we have this table that I want us to put up here. And for us just to kind of start to think about how we view God and the interactions that we have with him based on that title. So I'm going to give you some examples here. So the first column is that title that we give God. So obviously the first one is God. And the second column is who we are in comparison to that title. So what's our role in that relationship according to what we describe God as? So if God is God, then we are human then the interaction that takes place between human and God is worship or adoration or something like that. So to give you like a second example, we have God is our creator and we are his creation. So what are some actions that would take place between creation and his creator or her creator? Maybe you could say the creation is molded according to the creator's design, or we are shaped by how the creator gives us. So kind of take some time and brainstorm, like how would you fill out this, this, uh, this table? Like what are some titles that you commonly think about God as and how you relate with him? Who are we in relationship to that title that we give God? And what are the actions that determine kind of the nuances of that relationship and how we interact with them. Take a couple minutes just to kind of get a couple, and then we'll go from there. Okay, so what are some, what are some of the first things that you had? Like, what's a title for God that someone wrote down? Yes. Father. Our Father, for sure. That's a good one. Anyone else had Father? Cool, a couple of us. So then, what was, what's our relationship to the title of God as our Father? Son and daughter, Right? So then the interactions that take place between God as father and us as sons and daughters looks like what? How would you kind of describe those interactions? Trusting, that's huge. Asking, did I hear asking? Yeah, asking, loving. <laughs> kind of receiving God's protection over us. Yeah, that's good. What's a, we'll get a second one. What's the second idea that someone wrote down for a title of God? Teacher? Yeah, that's good. Anyone else had teacher? Single person. Well done. Then uh, who would we be in relationship to God as a teacher? Student, for sure. And then we're just constantly learning, submitting to his wisdom and that kind of thing. So there's all sorts of ways that we can go with this. In fact, I can show you kind of a completed table of just some things that I put down. So you have God as our Lord, which means that we're our servant. So we serve the Lord. That's kind of the primary interaction with us there. You have leader and follower. We follow his guidance. We submit to his will. We have teacher-student. We learn from his wisdom. Master-apprentice. We learn from his example. He forms our actions, trains us. Father, son, and daughter. We talked about that one. Or king and peasant. Or king-civilian. 
where we abide by his decrees. Like, these are kind of the primary ways we understand who God is and how we relate with God, correct? But notice this, this common strand or this common theme that is found in every single one of these titles. These are all vertical relationships. In other words, these are all relationships where God is above us in some way, and we're below him. Where God is above us. So these kind of metaphors, these kind of ways for how we understand our relationship with God is really good. Like these are really important because they remind us that God is so much greater than we could ever possibly be. We're reminded that God is so much more supreme than we could ever imagine. And he is just so much more infinite and sovereign and powerful. And we in comparison are just mere humans. (laughs) We're so much more insignificant. We're sinful. We're prone to wander. We're prone to make mistakes. Like these kind of titles help us to recognize that gap. And so naturally, in these relationships, the lesser submits to the greater. So you have these arrows in your packet, and this is pretty much what it looks like, where God is kind of like pouring into us from this above standpoint, and we're either submitting to him and receiving what he's always giving us, or we're just always trying to reach back up. And that's kind of the direction that you see in these vertical relationships. But Jesus introduces a whole new way for how we relate with God in this passage. So Jesus introduces instead a horizontal relationship that tells us that God is with us. God is with us. And so now over here in the arrows, you have God on one side and us on the other. And so what Jesus says is that now the the relationship between us and God is no longer like this. It's like this. It's horizontal. We're connected. It's intimate. It's a friendship. It's a friendship. And that is where the disciples get uncomfortable because they're like, how dare you wash my feet, Jesus? You're not supposed to be on this level with me. I'm supposed to be doing this for you. And and Jesus completely levels the playing field. And we also, I think, may have some tensions with this idea of Jesus actually being friends with us or us legitimately being friends with him. And so I kind of want to talk about three of those tensions. And the first one is just simply what we've already talked about, and is that we elevate servanthood above friendship. Like, again, we kind of we scoff at the idea of friendship because we think it's this fun idea, but, like, it can't really be that serious because if you were a mature, committed Christian, then your entire life needs to be about serving him solely, right? So we kind of think it's cute when kids say that, yeah, I'm friends with Jesus, and we think it's really fun, just like the video we watched at the beginning, but then the Christians that we think are really mature are the ones who are doing all this stuff. They're the missionaries who are traveling across the country. They're the speakers who are getting all these extra conversions. They're the guy who's always talking about the Lord and who's just serving in and out every single weekend, right? We associate mature Christians with how well they serve and how well they do stuff for God. So naturally, we just have this infatuation with service, which needs to happen, but we kind of set this idea of being friends with God off to the side. And it's really important that we don't do that. But I think the second tension, and this one is, I think, the most true, is that we wrestle with being friends with God because of simply who God is. Do you remember the day when you simply sat there and considered everything about who God is and you just were simply overwhelmed because of how bad you were. Where you said, God, I am so insignificant in comparison to who you are. How could you possibly love me? How could you possibly want to be in a relationship with me because of all these things that I've done? I am unforgivable. You, you, you are just so grand and I just, I cannot possibly imagine you even want to be with me. I think maybe we've all been in stages with our relationship with God in that way. And so some of us may settle with these, I, these vertical relationships, the, these titles for God, because they almost distance us from him. 
And so kind of a sub-point to this is a lot of times we kind of use God's greatness to exclude us, or sorry, we use God's greatness as an excuse to exclude him. So that's where you have a lot of people who maybe are content with having this distance because they know if they get close to God and they get onto this intimate friendship with God, then there's going to be something revealed about their life that they're not ready to to identify with. And so your next blank is we're afraid of befriending Jesus because of the intimacy required with a holy God. So we view friendship as this really nice ideal that, man, sounds really great, but maybe we think it's just as unlikely to happen just as me becoming friends with Chris Pratt or Steve Jobs or Kerry Walsh. And the third reason why maybe we wrestle with being friends with God is simply from past friendship experiences. How many of us have been hurt by a friend before? How many of us have hurt our friends before? (laughs) Right? So as much as we need friendship, as much as we need connection with other people, and as great of a joy and pleasure that they bring to our lives, like we talked about last week, they also have the potential of wrecking our lives, just as we have the potential of wrecking someone else's. That, that's what happens. That, that's the risk we take when we get so close to people. And I think a lot of times we let our experience with friendship or our really surface-level understanding of friendship here in America kind of determine what it looks like to be friends with God. So maybe we're afraid to be friends with God because we think we're going to hurt his feelings and cast him away and that he's not going to want to do anything with us if we do something wrong. Or maybe we're just afraid that he's going to let us down. We can't trust him. But whenever we ignore what Jesus says in John chapter 15, whenever we default back to a relationship with God that's defined strictly by service without intimacy, we, in retur- we reinterpret the gospel as God coming to earth to turn us into his slaves. We reinterpret Jesus' words as, I no longer call you friends, but servants. As if he comes here just to get in this really deep connection with us, and then it's all about how much we do for him. It's a very, very one-sided relationship, and we cannot, we cannot get to this point of viewing our relationship with Jesus like that. Because it's, it's detrimental to our faith. Brian Edgar describes it this way. He says, to think in this way is to reverse the actual trend of Jesus' thought and to guarantee the development of a works-related and and duty-oriented view of discipleship, rather than one permeated by the grace and love of friendship. This is why legalistic faith happens, right? Like, it's not so much about being in a relationship with God. It's not about being in friendship with God. It's about how well the lesser serves the greater. It's all about this duty-oriented life of making sure we do all these things and that we're obligated to serve God in, these, in this way. I mean, that's how the Pharisees viewed their relationship with God, right? And Jesus was a huge fan of that lifestyle. Not really. A strictly Lord-to-servant relationship without any intimacy involved whatsoever, is not what God has in mind for his creation. Because if we believe the gospel, then we believe that God came down and humbled himself as a man to become just like us. And not just to try to whip us into shape and to make sure we're doing all this stuff right and that we're serving him. that's, That's not the main reason why he came down to this earth. He came to this earth to live among us, to befriend us, even the worst of sinners, almost as if he knew that it is our God-given design to be shaped and influenced by our relationships, by our friendships. And so by living a holy and perfect life, he took the punishment that was reserved for us by laying his life down for his friends by laying his life down for you. He calls you his friends, friends. 
And there is no greater love than one who lays his down, who lays down his life for his friends. And so Jesus becomes this fullest expression of this self-sacrificial love for us, but then he also becomes the fullest expression of what it means to be friends with anybody. With anybody. And that is what's called grace. Because here's the thing, the the titles that we give to God don't change. God will always be greater than we could ever imagine. God will always be so much beyond our comprehension, and he's just, and we're so insignificant, right? Like, he will, will always have this void, but the way that friendship becomes possible with God, the way that we are actually able to befriend who God is, is because the void that separates us between who we are and who God is, is filled with grace, And so now his grace becomes even more magnified when we consider the possibility of actually being friends with the Lord. So living in God's grace means being God's friend. Living under God's grace is literally best understood as a friendship. It's this free willing, this mutual giving choice that we have to, to be in a friendship with the Lord. And so you have this, this crazy thing where literally friendship equals grace. So there's, there's a couple of blanks there uh, that we're actually going to skip over because we, have, uh, we don't have enough time. But we're going to go ahead and move into... Um, some really important points that we need to understand here because when we take Jesus' words for what it is, that we're no longer servants, but that we're friends and that we're uh, on this level playing field with an incredibly gracious God, then what we discover is that friendship moves from being the last term we would use to describe our relationship with God to the primary term. Because how we relate with a God who's so much greater than us is defined by that grace. And so let me explain here. <laughs> this, is, this is where things get kind of get confusing. So again, we, we remember what, J- what Jesus says in John chapter 15, that there's, greater, there's no greater love than this than he who lays down his life for his friends. Friendship is bound by self-sacrificial love. It's a love where we lay down our lives for the other person. It's a, it's a love where we're serving them. (laughs) It's a love that's based on service. What in the world is going on here? So we just literally spent the past, what, 30 minutes talking about how our relationship with God is no longer defined by how well we serve him, but yet Jesus is still coming back to this point where, oh no, our relationship with him is still based on serving. (laughs) So bad. So, but here's what we got to understand though, is that this is an entirely different type of of serving that we're talking about. Because the past three years of ministry, the past couple of years of Jesus drilling this service-oriented life into his disciples is because he was preparing them for what it means to be friends with him, for what it means to be friends with God, and what it means to be friends with other people. And that's because selfishness cannot exist in healthy relationships. Friendships are not one-sided. They are where we are mutually serving each other because we want to, not because we have to. So we, we spent kind of the majority of our time talking about a faith in Jesus where we're primarily the ones who are always doing the serving. And when we do that, we almost make ourselves out to be Jesus' friends or Jesus' slaves. That's kind of your next point here. When our relationship with God is mainly focused on us always serving him, we are turned into Jesus' slaves. And I'm not talking about like the slaves that the Apostle Paul talks about in Romans where we're slaves to righteousness, we're slaves to God. Like that is a totally different kind of conversation that Paul is having there in that passage. This is much more of a relationship with God that's determined by obligated service that doesn't bring any kind of liberation whatsoever. But we also, on the flip side, do the exact same thing to Jesus where we kind of put ourselves at the top of the hierarchy here where when our relationship with Jesus is solely based about what he does for us, then we make Jesus out to be our slaves. You see the tension here? 
Whenever selfishness is involved in a friendship, it immediately turns into slavery because it's about what they do for you or what you do for them. So that is why, and this is your next point here, is that friendship is defined by mutual service between both parties. Friendship is defined by mutual service between both people. So the rule of service within our relationship with God doesn't change. Like, we're, we're still going to serve the Lord, but the motivation behind it radically changes. Dramatically changes. And so in your packet, there's, a, there's another table here that kind of shows the difference between what master-servant service looks like and friend-to-friend service looks like, and just the different dynamics of what those relationships are. And so we're just going to walk through each column here. And the first one is that a master-servant relationship does what the master wants, does what the boss wants, but then a friend-friend relationship does what the friend wants. That seems obvious, but that's pretty drastically different from doing what your friend wants versus who your boss wants. The second one is a servant-master relationship acts out of duty. And the second for friend-to-friend relationships is that they act simply out of the friendship. They act out of who they are and the history that you guys have had and the story that your friendship has. That's what motivates you to do those things for your friend. Servant-master relationships, obedience is the central virtue. Then in friend-friend relationships, Friendship and love are central virtues. In servant-master relationships, the servant does not really know the master, but in friend-friend relationships, you know the friend intimately. In a servant-master relationship, it's defined by doing, whereas a friend-friend relationship is defined by being. In a servant-master relationship, servanthood is a requirement or as a friend-friend relationship, friendship is a gift of grace. The other person chooses to be your friend, and that is a gift. In a servant-master relationship, it's work-oriented, but a friend-friend relationship is relationship-oriented. And finally, a servant-master relationship is hierarchical in form. One is above the other, but in a friend-friend relationship, it's egalitarian in form. It's equal. It's equal across both parties. It's horizontal. Do you see what happens? What you have on the left is a legalism, works-based faith that will absolutely drown you in your relationship with God. But what you have on the right is a relationship with God that is going to completely change your life because it sets you free from you having to have it all together. It sets you free from having to always have your poop in a group. It frees you from having to have everything perfectly done, because at the end of the day, you do everything for God. You are who you are simply because of who your friend is. You do these things because you want to. I get really emotional about this because this was a huge place in my life. So much of my life, and even just growing up, um, I just felt like I had to earn my relationship with God. I was so determined to make sure that I just had everything together, and the day, my best days were when I did a great job of living righteously. But if there was ever a moment when I slipped up or I did something that I heavily regretted, I would not give myself a break. And I thought that God was doing the exact same thing. But then finally, there came a point during my uh, college years, I was reading through this book, and it talked all about a relationship with God that looks just like that on the right, where it's, it's, it's free, and, and, and you know each other intimately, and you want, to, you want to live a righteous life, you want to be holy, you want to do all these, all these things, not because it's just this, this crazy high demand that this God who's far removed from us demands us to do. Certainly, he's still our king, and he's our Lord, and we need to obey him, but we do these things out of the friendship that we have with him. We, we do these things because we are 
because we want to. Because it's our natural response to a God of grace in that way. Yes. Yeah. So isn't most of this all happening in the Holy Spirit? Mm-hmm. Yeah. But that hasn't been said, and that is very important. Absolutely. And it's the Holy Spirit who's constantly living in us, and he's fostering that relationship with the Lord and with us. And it's all made possible because of what Christ does on the cross for us. That's what makes this entire reality even possible for us to be friends with him. Yeah, great point. Thank you. Thank you. So, something that really cool happens when we become friends with God and when we can own this, this side of the relationship is that Christianity becomes a lot more fun. Our relationship with the Lord becomes a lot more fun. It's not this, this thing that we kind of have to dread or that, like, you know, we, we have to go to these things because since we're free of obligation and we're doing all, the, all of this stuff free willingly, then we can actually have a relationship with God that is life-giving, that completely transforms everything that we do. So I think all of us have heard that we primarily relate with God by what? Doing the spiritual disciplines. You know, so those things include praying to him, it includes reading scripture, it includes going to weekend worship, it includes fasting, silence, solitude. And we hear preachers talk to you all the time about how you need to make sure you do these things. You need to do these things if you're going to be in a good relationship with the Lord. But something that preachers don't talk a lot about is going about the spiritual disciplines in a way that really resonates with who you are. And in a way that resonates with what you value, the things that you love. So if any of us have ever struggled with doing the disciplines, maybe a first question we got to ask is, maybe we just need to do them in a way that resonates a little bit more with who we are. Just because one person tells you that you need to foster your relationship with God this way, maybe doesn't necessarily mean that that will work for you. So I'm going to kind of get, just kind of walk through what that looks like, just kind of by giving my own little examples. So there, there was a point where uh, reading scripture for me was mainly reading like a small, a small passage of scripture, and I would journal on it, and I would reflect on it, and it worked really well for a large part of my life, but then as I was going about in grad school, and I was doing a lot of reading, like kind of what I valued and the things I did were changing some of my daily habits, like I was reading all the time. So I wondered, maybe after, uh, after my scripture reading was getting a little dry and dull after some it just felt more like an obligation. I was like, what if, what if I freshen up my, my scripture reading by investing in this thing that was going to allow me to read scripture like a story? And so I uh, invested in this thing called Bibliotheca. It's a really cool, cool way to read scripture. It turns it into four different volumes, and it actually takes out chapter numbers and verse numbers, so you can just read scripture for what it is. And it become, you can go ahead and go to that next slide. It's gorgeous, and it's just a whole new way for me to interact with Scripture. And it resonated with where I'm at in this particular season of my life. And this was something that was so life-giving again. And it was so free because it resonated with my love to read. And some other things that I do uh, that are really, really fun is I love to write. So I'll always take a journal with me, or I'll go to a coffee shop like this wonderful place. Maybe some of you have been here before and I'll get a really good latte and enjoy being with God through reading scripture in a way that resonates with what I love and to write and to enjoy just this atmosphere of a coffee shop and a simple beverage. And this is something that's fun, and I can be with the Lord in a way that's like a friendship here. And it goes even beyond just the disciplines. So what I'm not saying, hear me out, I'm not saying that we can like replace we can replace these disciplines that have been tradition for how we relate with God over centuries with anything that we want, right? But it's finding out how we can do these things in ways that really resonate with who we are. But then, it's also recognizing that since God is constantly with us, and he's this friend who never fades away, and is present in everything that we do, it's seeing that he's a part of every other element of our life. And so, He's also, I love to enjoy my favorite meal by going to Chipotle 
and enjoying the greatest food on the face of this earth, and I can dine with him there. Uh, I also uh, love playing this game called Rocket League. It's literally the stupidest game you'll ever play, but it's, it's race cars and soccer. And, like, and I can play that and say, like, you know, I can be with the Lord in this. There's no spiritual significance whatsoever to this, but it's recognizing that even he can be with me as I'm enjoying this thing. And it's also when I love to run. Running is a way of how I can relate with the Lord, but also being with the people that I love the most. Like this is just one picture of some really close friends of mine from school enjoying a meal. God is present there and let alone with my family who I would not be who I am today if it weren't for how God used them to work in my life. And even my job at Cafea is an opportunity for me to be with the Lord in a really special way because God isn't just this person that we reserve 30 minutes a day for. He's a friend who does life with us in every single way. And he wants us to be able to invite him into those things that we love because he's given us passions for a reason. And we can invite him into those things. But if there's anything that I say tonight that you don't remember, but if there, but if there is anything that you do need to remember from this session, it's, it's just kind of this last thing as, as we're wrapping up. So what we talked about last week is that we are designed for community. We are hardwired for connection. We are people. We are persons. You guys remember the phrase that we talked about last week? You are who you're with, right? You are who you're with. You, the people in your life are constantly shaping you and influencing you and forming you in more ways than we could possibly imagine. So if we embrace Jesus as our closest friend, spending time with him in the spiritual disciplines, but also inviting him into every area of our lives and every single part of our day and where it is this close-knit thing where grace is the dominant thing that is ruling our lives and that we are free, willing, free willingly serving him and him free willingly serving us, we're laughing with him and crying with him, following his will, and we're going to be shaped and formed more and more into his image. And so th- this, is, this is your final point. Th- this, this is the big thing here, is that befriending the Lord becomes the most transformative thing we could ever possibly do. Because we are letting his friendship influence every aspect of who we are, just as friendships are designed to do. I'm just going to say that again. Befriending the Lord becomes the most transformative thing we could possibly do because we are letting his friendship influence every aspect of who we are, just as friendships are designed to do. And Brian Edgar puts it this way. He says, this friendship with God, like all true friendships, is transformative. It is inevitable that friends become like those with whom they live closely and whom they appreciate, admire, and love. And so, as we live in friendship with Christ, we are transformed into his likeness. So to become like Christ means befriending Christ. It's allowing his grace to guide every single thing that we do and to embrace the intimacy that comes in that. So, If you're walking away today, maybe thinking that this relationship with God is too good to be true, then my job's complete. (laughs) Um, Because it's something that consistently blows me away every single day. That a Lord and, and that a God who is far much more than we could ever imagine, who is so much greater than us, values us and loves us and who isn't content with just us being like this. He closes that gap and he brings us like this for us to be friends. So maybe for some of you, this is all review. 
Maybe this is all like, yeah, this is, this is, this is good stuff, and, uh, you know, and, and you've embraced a relationship with the Lord like this for a very long time, and this is just more specifically putting language to it. But maybe for some of us, this is a radically new way to view who God is to you. And so, as we leave today, I just want you to think about how would your life change? How would life be different if we start to embrace our language for our relationship with God as a friendship. That's kind of the challenge I want us to relate with. What if we stop referring to having an ambiguous, undefined relationship with God and embrace the language of having a friendship with God? Because then I think when we do that, then we're going to become so much more liberated, which means that we're going to become even more and more formed into his image, which means that we're ultimately going to reach more people for the gospel and following the work that the Holy Spirit's doing in this life. And so what I want us to do is just uh, close in prayer and then head off and explore what this looks like from here on out. Let's pray. Lord, you're so good. You're so gracious. And you are so, so much greater than we could ever possibly imagine. And we just thank you for all the work that your son has done. That our relationship with you is defined by this love that is not one-sided. It's not us constantly trying to reach up to you. And it's not you who's just only constantly meeting our needs. This is something that is a mutual exchange between us. And Lord, I just simply apologize for our tendency to distort this relationship with you that you have originally designed for us, to be in a covenant with you, where maybe we viewed you as out of reach, or maybe we're unable to fully relate with you, or where we've just taken advantage of our relationship with you and think that it's all about what you do for us and just so we can get our way. But God, I pray that you can teach us more and more uh, what it means to be liberated by the grace of being in a friendship with you God, that you can just keep working in our lives and that you can transform us in radically different ways. We thank you for everything, and we just continue to pray that you can be with those who are here and those who are unable to be here and that we can pursue what this friendship with you looks like and how this is simply the start for how we understand all of our other friendships. God, we love you so much. We thank you for all that you're doing, and we give all this back to you. In your name we pray. Amen. One final comment is that Jesus becomes this purest and most clear expression of what it means to be friends with anybody. Like he blows our modern understanding of what friendships are out of the world and he actually sets the stage for how we're able to relate with each other as Christians within the church. And so that's what we're going to talk about next week is what it means to befriend the church and how our Christian friendships are actually some of the greatest human friendships we could ever possibly have. So be sure to be here this week or next week And we'll catch you guys then. Thank you so much.